Hi, I'm Terry, and welcome to another video. Today, black powder percussion caps. Can you make your own at home? And more importantly, do you really want to? Well, obviously you can. There's been several other videos on how to make them at home. So that's really not an issue. The big question is, is it worth the expense, the, the time, the effort, and the money? Well, let's look into that. First of all, uh, to make your own percussion caps, you're going to need a few things. You're going to have to buy a couple specialty items, like you're going to need a die. comes in two parts. I'll give you a close-up of this here in a bit. You're going to need to purchase this. And you're going to need to purchase some priming compound, which comes in a set of four baggies with a little measuring scoop. We'll get into all that, too. And I'm going to put a link on where you can buy these down in the comments section. Uh, the die right now is selling for $50 and the primer for $20. Uh, that includes taxes but not shipping. Shipping is variable. It really depends on where you live. But um, let's say, just to keep the math simple, a $100 bill. Okay, $100 to get both. There's enough priming compound here to make approximately 2,000 percussion caps. So, counting the initial startup cost, your caps are going to cost you about five cents each. And after you've made that back, they're going to cost you about one and a half cents. In contrast, I bought this package of Remington number 10 caps at a local sporting goods store for $12. That's 12 cents a piece. So on the surface, it seems like, yeah, you can, uh, you can save a lot of money making your own caps. But that really depends on how much you shoot. Example, if you shoot 200 caps a year or go through about two packs of these a year, it's going to take you about three years just to make back your initial investment. In that event, is it really worth the investment to make your own or just buy a couple of packages of caps and put them on a shelf? If you shoot 2,000 caps a year, then yeah, you could save a couple hundred dollars a year. Not factoring in your time, because where I can just buy this, and I'm done. I can keep it in a shirt pocket, put it on a shelf, whatever. By making your own, you're going to have to take the time to sit down and make them. And as we're going to see, that's it's not hard, but it is time uh, intensive. It is kind of time intensive. There is some time involved in it and you know, time is money. I've got things to do. Do I really want to take the time to sit down and make percussion caps? Well, that's what we're going to look at. In addition to the dye and the chemicals, you are going to need a few other items. Uh, for example, you're going to need some metal to stamp the dyes out with. This is a Mountain Dew can. Got a little more here. And the dye really only works with aluminum and it comes with a warning only to use aluminum like beer cans or soda cans and I'm tempted to try some very thin gauge brass shim stock but I'm afraid it would probably wear the teeth on this die out a lot faster there are some pros and cons to using aluminum which I'll bring up over the course of making them. You're also going to need some other things like uh, you're going to need a pair of tweezers, which you don't really need, but they do come in handy. Eyedropper, you're going to need some acetone. You're going to need uh, one of these little barbecue skewers I found works really well as a tamping stick to tamp the priming compound down with. And a sheet of paper or an artist's brush to mix the compound with. And last, something to set your caps on while they're drying. Yes, you cannot make these this morning and shoot them in the afternoon. You make them today and you shoot them tomorrow. That's just something you have to deal with when you're making your own caps. Also, this die only stamps out number 10 caps. So, first of all, can you make a commercial grade percussion cap at home? Meaning, is what you're going to make at home going to look like one of these you take out of a package. No. First of all, the cap itself is very different and you may or may not like how they fit, but also the priming compound is different. This is not commercial compound. This is not what is used 
in commercial caps or any other kind of primer, for example. The, uh, the most popular primer used today is a lead-based. It consists of lead stiffnate, uh, tetracine, PETN, and um, a little barium nitrate for as an oxidizer and some other chemicals maybe. Um, lead stiffnate, PETN, and tetracine are themselves explosive compounds sensitive to impact as well as friction and heat. And it's the impact that we're really interested in. But those are hard to buy simply because they are explosives. You can't just ship them through the mail. All right. Yes, you can get them with the right federal permits and the, the right shipping and the right uh, storage facilities. You can buy it. You can buy priming compound for reloading cartridge guns at home. But it's not easy and they're not cheap. This stuff is composed of four different materials, individually, none of which are explosive and can be shipped through the mail. In fact, you can buy all but one of these from Amazon. And you can get the other one, which I'll go into in a bit, from any company over the internet or where you live, maybe you can just walk in, any store that sells uh, supplies for making your own pyrotechnics. And I'll include a link on that as well, along with the 22LR Reloader, is the name of the company, that sells these priming kits and dies in the comment section. So let's look at the first part and that is the, uh, the die, stamping these things out. Let's stamp out a cap. Okay, first, and I'll give you a close up here of the die. It's composed of two parts, and it fits together like that, and it stamps out a cap. And you take a sheet of aluminum, just take a beer can or a soda can, and just open it up and a pair of scissors. So what we do is we take the die, we put the aluminum, in that slot, put it down, bang it, take it out, and there's your cap. It drops out the other end. And there's your cap, if you don't drop it. And it looks like this, if you can see that. I'll try and get you a better close-up of it. Now, there's a problem with this, though. Um, it's actually... It comes out a little too big, at least for my firearms. So what I've discovered was this little barbecue, the bamboo barbecue skewer here that I also use to tamp the powder in with, is just about the same size as a nipple. So if I put it on here and then squeeze and rotate, it compresses the cap around it and I get a much better fit. And that's really all there is to making the cap. Fairly simple. And I'm going to make a few more of these because I'm going to try two different methods of priming. One I know works, one I'm not sure will work or not because I've never tried it before. So I'm going to stamp out 12 of these and there's, there's five. So I'm going to stamp out 12 of these and uh, go to the next step. Okay, and that is that. There's our 12 caps. And that takes us to the priming compound. Now, as I've said, this is not uh, used commercially by firearms manufacturers. This material, which is called Primol, was actually developed in the early 1930s and offered to the military under the trade name H-48. Back in the early 1930s, the U.S. military was looking for a lead-free substitute 
for their ammunitions primers, for small ammunition. Yes, even back in the 1930s, people knew lead was toxic and the military was looking for a lead-free alternative. H-48 was developed to serve that purpose, but abandoned it several years later for several reasons. First, let's look and see what's in here. We have antimony trisulfide, then either potassium chlorate or potassium perchlorate, sulfur, and finally ground glass. The kit also comes with this handy measuring spoon. And you'll see on the baggies, you'll see a little label that says either S for small or an L2. You can see that L2. And that represents how many of each size of scoop that you use. So on L2, you'll use two of the large scoops. On the L, you'll use one scoop. And then on small, of course, you'll use one small scoop. So it really makes it easy <clears throat> to measure out the material. It's uh, They kind of take out the, the measuring for you. So you don't have to have a scale. You don't have to do any calculations or, or weights. Just follow the instructions. Individually, these chemicals are safe. I mean, sulfur, you know, ground glass. They have a very long, stable shelf life, and they are not dangerous. But once they're mixed, they form an, an explosive compound that you want to be careful with as when you're dealing with any explosive compound. And there are two ways that you can mix these, and I'm going to demonstrate both. Get that off of there first. Sheet of paper, and we're going to mix our chemicals. So we're going to take one ground glass. Oh, yeah. Before that, let's get back to this one. Potassium chlorate, or what might be potassium perchlorate. Uh, basically, anybody who makes their own pyrotechnics will tell you not to mix these two together, chlorates and sulfur. They don't really like each other very much, and they can interact over time and spontaneously ignite, meaning go boom. Now, in order to counteract that, the H48, or primol, also contains an inhibiting agent, which is probably uh, sodium bicarbonate, baking soda. And then there is also uh, a hardening agent in it, which in H48 was, I believe, gum Arabic. And uh, I think Primal might use something else. They call it proprietary hardening agent. But um, yeah, that's, uh, you really, for long term, you don't want to mix these two together, chlorates or perchlorates and sulfur. So I don't recommend that you make a thousand of these and put them on the shelf. Make today what you're going to use tomorrow, if you're going to make them at all. Also, if you want to save yourself some money, you can go on Amazon Prime and you can get the antimony trisulfide, the sulfur, and the ground glass in one pound bags. And then you can go to Pyrotechnics Supply and you can get the potassium chlorate and perchlorate both. So what's the difference? Well, potassium chlorate has a much more vigorous um, interaction and it's a little more unstable. It isn't used much anymore, but it is still around. The uh, potassium perchlorate has a much better shelf life. It's not as twitchy, you might say, as chlorate. There's an, but that's not why the military abandoned it. It's not why they, they stopped using it. It seemed to work great at first. But over time, uh, they noticed that their soldiers' weapons were rusting at a much faster rate than they should be, despite stringent cleaning procedures. They finally tracked it down to the primer. When potassium, or any actually, chlorate or chlorates oxidize, it produces potassium chloride, which is the potassium version of table salt. And as we all know, table salt mixed with water can be extremely corrosive. The cleaning kits issued by the military at that time did not remove chlorides, potassium chloride. So while their firearms looked clean, they weren't, and they were rusting. For various reasons, mostly economical, the military decided to go back to the lead-based primers, and that was the end of H-48. 
until recently. So this is something that you want to be aware of. If you switched, for example, from black powder to 777, Pyrodex, or some other sulfur-free substitute uh, to get away from having to clean your firearms so much because of the corrosive nature of the, the sulfur, you're adding the corrosive nature back into the mix. So cleanliness is very important and you're basically giving up the reason why you switched from sulfur-based black powder to a sulfur-free substitute in the first place. And that's something you want to be aware of. So to start out, we're going to mix L2, with two large scoops of ground glass. Let me make sure I got the large scoop here. And it's, you don't have to pack them in. You just kind of fill the scoop up. There's one. Oh, this is not ground glass. I'm sorry. We're going to do two scoops of the potassium chlorate or chloride, as the case may be. Get all the little crunchies out of it. Make sure it's nice and powdery. And at this stage, this stuff is perfectly harmless. There's, I mean, that's why you want to do it before you mix. And actually, we want to measure this stuff out before we mix it together. So there's the two scoops of that. And then we're going to do one large scoop of antimony trisulfide. trisulfide. We want to do one small scoop of sulfur. And we want one small scoop of ground glass. So if you're wondering what purpose the ground glass serves, uh, it helps provide friction. Remember this material is, is sensitive to uh, impact, friction, and heat. And now to mix it, you definitely do not want to take a spoon or something and start rubbing it because as soon as this stuff gets mixed together, it becomes sensitive to, what did I say? Huh? Impact. What was the other one? Friction. So you want to be careful at this stage. This stuff can go up as soon as you start mixing it. You can use an artist's brush and gently mix the stuff together. But the way that it's recommended really is this. You just start mixing it together. And you'll notice there's some crunchies here. So we're going to start grinding those up before we get everything mixed together. And this could take a few minutes. You can, I can see there's still some sulfur in there. And we still got a few crunchies around the outside, which you want to be careful with now, because this stuff is. And some of this stuff, you're not going to get it all mixed. That's all right. You just want to keep doing this until you got an even gray color. And if my wet method works, this becomes basically unnecessary and irrelevant. That's why I want to try it. Once it's wet with either water or acetone, or while it's wet, uh, this stuff is perfectly harmless. It is not going to go off. So once we add some acetone to it, it ain't doing nothing until that acetone dries. 
little bit more and let's fast forward a little. I think that's about as good as we're going to get it. Now, we're going to need to charge the cap. And for that, we want to take just a small amount in our scoop. And we want to kind of avoid this crunchy stuff here. And you can also, I mean, you can grind this stuff up separately in a mortar and pestle. I'll let this stuff sit on the shelf for a while. I probably should have done that before doing this. And you can grind it up to a really fine powder. Separately, it's completely harmless. Well, more or less, completely harmless. So anyway, here's how it says to do this. Put it on the white sheet here. Is dump a little in. Then we're going to take our tamping stick and we're going to push it down. Being careful not to twist or twirl. And you can see where this the time comes in on this one. This is... Um, Take some time. So I'm hoping, really hoping, that wet method works better. And then we're going to press that down. And set it off to the side. And we're going to do six like that. Okay, so we've got our six set off there to the side. Now, I'm going to put the rest of this in a shot glass. Yes, this is a shot glass. Actually, I'm not. First, <laughs> forgot a step. I'm going to get some acetone in here. And, and you don't need very much acetone, and um, you can actually buy it in very small amounts. You don't have to buy like gallon cans or anything. Um, commercially, it's called fingernail polish remover. So we'll go to Walmart, get some fingernail polish remover, and you're good to go. And we're going to put a drop in each one. And that will activate our priming com or a hardening compound there and now we just let that dry now I'm going to mix the rest of this priming compound with just a tiny bit of acetone set my caps up over here in advance and an eyedropper and again, we're just going to put a drop or two or three in each cap. There. So what am I going to do with the rest of these? Well, I'm going to punch out a few more caps and see what happens. So I'm going to set these up to dry. I don't want to throw it away. So I'm going to set these up to dry. Okay, so I got those set up to dry. Now we wait until tomorrow and uh, we'll take them outside and we'll try them out.